wicked attack, the Queen condemns the Manchester suicide bomber. As she meets the injured in hospital, she speaks out against the atrocity. Very wicked. Mm. And, uh, to, to, to target that sort of thing. Yeah, you know. yeah, it's, uh, it's awful. At the stroke of 11, Manchester United in memory of the 22 people killed. I'm live in the city where the police investigation is making significant progress. And there will be more dramatic arrests, detectives searching for anyone who may have helped Salman Abedi. From Manchester, this is the ITV Evening News with Mary Nightingale. Good evening from St Anne's Square here in Manchester where the Queen joined the country in remembering those killed and hurt in Monday night's attack. She visited some of the injured in hospital, heard their horrific stories and condemned the bombing as very wicked. She thanked staff for all their efforts in helping the casualties. And that work continues with 23 still in critical care, many of them young people. In the first of our reports, here's our Royal Editor Chris Ship on the Queen's tribute. For the hospital staff who'd had a traumatic week, this was not something they had expected. Throughout Manchester's Children's Hospital, there was a ripple of excitement when news spread this morning of the Queen's unexpected arrival here. It's the first on the scene as a paramedic from our ambulance services. Yeah, well. She met staff who'd worked tirelessly since Monday night, including those medics first to see the horrific scenes at Manchester Arena. Indeed, yes. And then to the young girls and their parents, like Evie Mills from Harrogate, who survived but saw things no one ever should. Uh, big shock, mm. really big shock for them, but for everybody really. Mm. Uh, well, very it's a scary. Thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very wicked. Mm. 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 Target, that sort of thing. Yeah, you know. yeah it's, uh, it's awful really. But what the Queen called a wicked act had, she said, brought this city together. We'll it's very interesting how everybody has united, haven't they? Yeah. Well, it's been amazing, really. Mm. And the stories they shared in this room were not always easy to hear. My, my daughter's she's just done, gone down to theatre. She's 12 years old. And um, she was with a friend, she was away, to, uh, and my daughter's friend's mum, and she died. She was one of the ones that got... She got Oh dear. Um, so and, and, and what happened to you? Were you? I had, um, yeah, I had a, uh, one of the wings as well, shrapnel mm -hmm. wound. So I think it's nuts and bolts that everybody's dreadful. Absolutely dreadful. And mine's gone through 15 centimetres out the other side. So I'm doing surgery later on this afternoon. Mm -hmm. There were moments to talk to the Queen about the happier times on Monday night. In her Ariana Grande t-shirt, Millie Robson spoke about meeting the star backstage. And, and you had enjoyed the concert, presumably. Yeah, it was really good. Was it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I got to meet her before the concert as well. She was lovely. Really? Yeah. But never could their minds stray far from the moment the bomb was detonated. I was just walking out to meet my dad because he was picking me and my friend up okay. from the concert and um, then it like went off behind us. It was just this boom, just, it went, it was just white and it was surreal, it was just quiet and it just picked up and I just said, I just look at me, just don't look anywhere else, look at me because it was just, obviously you can imagine carnage, yeah. bodies and stuff. <laughs> Rarely do we witness the Queen hearing such traumatic stories, but her visit here did provide this hospital and all of its staff with a few moments of relief in an otherwise dark week. Chris Ship, ITV News, Manchester Children's Hospital. Side by side, shoulder to shoulder, the people of Manchester today remembered all of those killed and injured in the attack. They observed a minute's silence before breaking into spontaneous applause and then song. And there were similar scenes across the city and indeed the country. Martin Geisler reports on the silent solidarity. This is what cities have to do when something awful is visited on them. With 22 dead and dozens injured, 
Hundreds came out into central Manchester today to remember lives lost and try to take in the events of this dreadful week. In St Anne's Square, they brought flowers, they shed tears and they stood shoulder to shoulder. On the stroke of 11, the place fell silent for a minute. It was impeccably observed by everyone, each with their own thoughts. At the city's Piccadilly station, travellers stood still, alongside staff and the armed police who patrol the concourse. This investigation continues apace, but at Greater Manchester Police Headquarters, officers and staff left their desks for a minute to pay their respects. At the city's Royal Infirmary, where many of the injured were taken, the doctors and nurses who could came together. In Royton, to the north of the city, traffic stopped, as people remembered. As they did in Bradford and Ipswich and under Big Ben. Police and army, now sharing the role of protecting our streets, stood silently, side by side. The silence was broken by spontaneous applause. How important do you think a moment like this is for the people of Manchester, just to come together? It's huge, it's really powerful, and it unites everyone here, so it's exactly what they need. Everybody's so compassionate, it's uh, just a very moving and sad time, obviously. And so the crowds dispersed and the city moved on, with one of the great Manchester anthems ringing out, from the tannoy in the station, and from the mouths of those gathered in St Anne's Square. Don't look back in anger, the spirit that'll help this city forward. Martin Geisler, ITV News, Manchester. Police say a series of arrests and raids in and around Manchester have seen very important items seized. More details have also emerged about the bombers' movements prior to the attack. The Didsbury Mosque, where Salman Abedi prayed, said that they had reprimanded him months earlier. And the terror plot's connection to Libya is becoming clearer. Our security editor, Rohit Kadru, has the latest on the hunt for clues. The suburbs of South Manchester early this morning. Soldiers, mate. Soldiers, says the man behind the phone. But these are armed specialist officers, and they've just raided another home. In Warwickshire, a hundred miles to the south, a suspect on the ground. He was chased by officers for half a mile before he was detained. There have been false alarms. The bomb squad called out in Manchester. It wasn't needed but there appears to be new confidence among investigators. I want to reassure people that the arrests that we have made are significant and initial searches of premises have revealed items that we believe are very important to the investigation. That candour indicates that police think they're close to finding out who supported the baby-faced, squeaky-voiced suicide bomber and they're learning more about his past. At his mosque, Abidi rarely spoke to other worshippers. He stopped coming a few weeks before travelling to Libya, when the chairman reprimanded him for refusing to take off his shoes. He said he was surprised by his response. His reaction was not good. 
you know. How did he react? Well, he, he was annoyed when I was telling him because I said to him that you're acting like a child. Because you're an adult, you should know better that you don't wear your shoes to the toilet coming into the water area. And what did he say? Well, he, he said he doesn't see any difference in that. And I said, yes, you should know better. A few yeah. days later, he was in Tripoli. Investigators are now looking at the Libyan connection. We know Salman Abidi went to Libya on the 18th of April to stay with his brother and father. He returned to Manchester a month later on the 17th of May. But ITV News has learned that Abidi's brother, Hashem, knew about the attack and that he spoke to Salman just 20 minutes before the bomb was detonated. And the investigation has now spread to Germany after it emerged that Abidi visited Dusseldorf four days before the attack. A family friend in Manchester spoke to Abidi's brother after the bombing. The family were very, very angry, uh, and they should be, like any other human being. Um, uh, they, they don't approve of this act and they, they, no one would approve of this act uh, and the family they'll do everything necessary to, to help whoever to, to take down this network the police suspect exists. These are remnants of Abidi's bomb which use the TATP explosives that are the hallmark of IS in Europe. This the detonator which was concealed inside brass casing. Homemade perhaps, sophisticated certainly and it helps explain the presence of armed police on trains today, a first for Britain which shows that whatever today's progress, police are still highly concerned. Rohit Katru, ITV News, Manchester. Well, we now have the names of all 22 innocent people killed at the Manchester Arena on Monday. Their ages range from 8 to 51, among them school children, young people and parents. Emma Murphy reports now on how their family and friends are remembering the victims. With every day, there are new faces to add to Monday night's dreadful roll call. Now we know of all 22 lives that were lost that night. The parents taken from their children, the children taken from their parents, the adored family members, lovers, friends and colleagues who leave voids which can never be filled. This was Chloe Rutherford. She was 17 and died with her 19-year-old boyfriend, Liam Curry from South Shields. Their family said they wanted to be together forever. They died as they had lived, by each other's sides, devoted and inseparable. I mean, the, the two of them were a perfect couple together when you saw them. Um, when she was working, Liam would come and pick her up and he'd be waiting outside in the car for her. Um, and you could just tell the way they got in that we're just a couple and they were meant to be together. Ailey McLeod was 14. She and a friend had travelled to the concert from their homes on the Scottish island of Barra. It was a birthday treat. She adored music and played the bagpipes in a pipe band. It's just too awful to, to think about. Uh, and it's the last thought of many people going to sleep at night in the islands and I'm sure further afield. And the first thought in the morning when they wake up as well. It's affected people deeply, even people who didn't know the girls. Courtney Boyle was 19 years old and a student in Leeds. Her mother described her as her rock and told of the pride she had brought her. Courtney died with her stepfather, Philip Tron. As she grieves her daughter and husband, Deborah Hutchinson told how he had made her world a happy place. Elaine McIver was a police officer. She was at the concert with her partner, Paul, who was critically injured. Her family say she was the best daughter, sister, auntie, colleague and friend that they could have hoped for. She was a good fun person um, and she always, she always was smiling and laughing. Um, there was never any, any issues at all. It was, she was always a nice person. Wendy Fowles' children are now without their mother. She was 50 and described by friends as a beautiful woman. She'd been at the concert with her daughter. In her hometown of Otley, a vigil was held in her honour. She was very fun and very loving, and, and her, her and her daughter, uh, Charlotte, they were like two peas in a pod, I think. The last death to be confirmed was that of 15-year-old Megan Hurley from Merseyside. She and all those who died, aged from 8 to 50 years old, were killed by one man who objected to their ways of life and believed that he had a right to bring those lives to an end. Emma Murphy. ITV News, Manchester. Theresa May today challenged leaked photos of the bomb used in the attack when she met President Trump 
as they attended a NATO summit. She said sensitive information they share must remain secure. The president vowed to get to the bottom of the security breach and urged nations to unite to defeat terror. From the meeting in Brussels, here's our Europe editor, James Mates, on the intelligence leaks. Awkward and unusual as it may be for a British Prime Minister to register a formal complaint with the US President, Mrs May came to NATO ready to tell Donald Trump his officials have been out of line. That partnership is built on trust and part of that trust is knowing that intelligence can be shared confidently and I will be making clear to President Trump today that intelligence that is shared between law enforcement agencies must remain secure. She was able to speak to him briefly today before the main summit began and as the president was guided through the magnificent atrium of NATO's new headquarters, he made it clear he'd got the message. These leaks threaten our national security, he said. The culprit should be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. At the ceremonial opening of the new building, it was the Manchester bombing that he spoke of first. Prime Minister May, all of the nations here today grieve with you and stand with you. I would like to ask that we now observe a moment of silence for the victims and families of the savage attack which took place in Manchester. Thank you. Terrible thing. But the tribute's over. President Trump launched into his fellow leaders with a tongue lashing about not paying what he called their fair share towards NATO. That NATO members must finally contribute their fair share and meet their financial obligations. As other leaders fidgeted nervously, it got worse. This is not fair to the people and taxpayers of the United States. And many of these nations owe massive amounts of money from past years and not paying in those past years. Britain is not one of those countries he alleges owes the US money, though that is not, of course, how NATO works. Trump's attitude to the organization was perhaps encapsulated by the way he pushed a fellow leader aside during a photo call. He once called NATO obsolete. He's clearly still unimpressed by it. <laughs> Just as worrying for European leaders will be what Donald Trump didn't say. He did not reaffirm American commitment to Article 5 of the NATO Treaty, which commits every member to go to the aid of any other if attacked. Now, normally every US president does this when they come here, because unless a potential enemy believes America would come to Europe's defense, NATO loses much of its deterrent value. James Mates in Brussels, thank you. Well, still to come on the ITV Evening News, how a row over the Manchester attack overshadowed the UKIP manifesto launch. And that story and more after the break. Welcome back to Manchester. Now, the main political parties have postponed election campaigning until tomorrow, but UKIP decided its manifesto launch should still go ahead today. And the party suggested that Theresa May must bear some responsibility for the attack here because of police cuts. Our political correspondent, Libby Wiener, was at the launch. In the shadow of Manchester, but were they exploiting it too? The question at today's UKIP manifesto launch, where the party leader said security and Islamic fundamentalism were the issues of our time. It is not the British way to turn a blind eye to evil in our midst. It is not good enough to light candles and proclaim that extremists will not beat us. Action is required on multiple fronts. When challenged on his approach, his supporters weren't impressed. You say that uh, lighting candles is not enough. Isn't that an insult to all the people who have come out? The manifesto's author then appeared to blame Theresa May. I think she must bear some responsibility. Although she later backtracked, saying only terrorists could be held responsible. Rather awkwardly, they then broke off to observe a minute's silence, after which Mr Nuttall defended the attack on Mrs May. 
Do you think it's fair to uh, say that Theresa May bears some responsibility for what happened? She was the Home Secretary for many, many years. She voted to reduce the number of police officers. She voted to reduce spending on security. A declining force after Britain voted to leave the EU. This week's events appear to have given UKIP a new focus. Libby Vina, ITV News, Westminster. Well, net migration to the UK fell to its lowest level in nearly three years in 2016. It's largely due to a big rise in the number of EU citizens leaving the country following the Brexit vote. And the former TV weatherman Fred Talbot has been convicted of a string of historical sex offences against schoolboys. He assaulted seven teenagers on trips to Scotland when he was a teacher more than 35 years ago. Well, back to events here now, and our security editor, Rohit Katru, joins me for final thoughts. So another very emotional day, and the police investigation is still very much underway. That's right, and after a period of almost panic and certainty, uh, of real uncertainty, I think we're now in a period of growing confidence uh, inside this investigation. But make no mistake, there's still so much to do. Usually when we report on terrorism investigations, we come to it right at the end after months and months of steady policing work. This is only the beginning. We are now on day four of this investigation and there is so much to do, so many new details that are still emerging. And one is coming out of Libya tonight. Uh, officials there are saying that in that final phone call with his mother, the suicide bomber told her, forgive me. Uh, well, this appears to... Uh, he appears to be uh, an unforgivable person. This an unforgettable event, certainly here in Manchester. All right, and, and, and the investigation continues. It does, all it right. does. Rohit, thank you very much indeed. And that is all for now. There is a special tonight programme on the Manchester attack at 7.30 this evening. Raggy Omar will be back with news at 10, but for me and all the team here in Manchester, have a good evening. Bye-bye.